Sweet. Thank you guys very much for coming. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I have an absolute piss ton of slides, like more than we'll probably get through like at all. Um, and they have a lot of the references, all that kind of fun stuff on them. So if you want, you can take your uh, cell phone and actually just text 44222 and then in the line put CBD hype, all one word, lowercase. So you can just text 44222 CBD hype. It'll then ask you for, hey, what's your email address? Type in your email and it'll automatically send you the whole slide deck. So that way if you have any questions or you want to look something up or you're like, whoa, we talked way too fast. I didn't understand any of that. Um, so you can do that. And then I'll be around all weekend too. So if you have any questions, just come up. Please find me. So how I got into CBD. How many have heard of CBD before, obviously? Most of you? Cool. How many of you actually currently use CBD? On a semi-daily basis. Okay, quite a few. Awesome. Uh, I got into this. I do a lot of kiteboarding. And I thought, what happens if I attempt to do a jump and it goes wrong and I get dropped out of the sky like a sack of potatoes and land on my head? I was like, is there anything I should be possibly taking ahead of time? Anything that I should be aware of where I can kind of hedge my bets a little bit? And what I found when researching that is uh, cannabinoids cannabinoids kept coming up, uh, especially CBD. It was about three and a half years ago. And there kept coming more and more data. And so that's how I started looking into it. Um, didn't really look at anything going on in the popular media until recently. And then all of a sudden, like CBD was literally like everywhere. Um, especially now, even within the past few months, there's just tons of stuff. So new local CBD oil drinks to hit the market. Uh, there's a hemp-based CBD uh, in Florida. There's actually a subsidiary that has a watermelon-flavored CBD gummies. So CBDs are everywhere. Uh, Maker Bay Energy hints that there's a CBD beverage coming out, which looks like that. <laughs> um, Killcliff has one now that has CBD in it. There's a Delray Beach restaurant supposedly cooking with CBD whipped cream, which if anyone's had just raw CBD, tastes like ass. I don't know how much they can put in like whipped cream and make it taste good, but as we'll find out, there's probably not a lot in there. But it's literally everywhere. And there's probably a good reason for that, most likely related to money. So they said it could be worth up to 10.5% of the estimated $23.7 billion estimated market for all CBD products. So the food and beverage now is like probably one of the greatest increase areas for CBD. Uh, I was recently doing some kiteboarding in Hood River, Oregon. And at the coffee shop, which is Dopio Coffee, they have really good coffee there, you could get a CBD shot actually added to your coffee. I'm not sure if I want to taste that in my coffee per se, but you can do that. So in short, there's probably a lot of people that are trying to make a lot of money off of CBD now, and it's become very popular. So then the question I wonder is, kind of like the old school public enemy, you know, should we really be buying into what is all of the hype surrounding this? And I've always wanted to put a public enemy CD in one of my talks anyway. <laughs> So this is a bunch of research that I've done, a bunch of other things that I do. So you can all read that later. Pretty exciting. Like you said, I listen to a lot of death metal. I think the three things that are black, death metal, dark coffee, dark beer. Probably after doing these talks, you can probably add other things to my list. I'm sure I'll get crazy emails from people about. Uh, disclosures. I do do some affiliate work for CBD hemp products through Charlotte's Web. You can ask me later. I don't have any links in this presentation. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't pay me any money, so that either means that I'm very pure trying to do research or I suck at marketing my services and nobody wants them. So, <laughs> so we're talking about cannabinoids as background and research. We'll talk a little bit about strains and compounds, delivery methods. Uh, the three things that I picked as topics for CBD, exercise performance, sleep, and what I believe is the number one use for CBD. Um, so this talk is a little bit of a mix of kind of uh, cannabis, cannabinoids, and also CBD because they're all intertwined with each other. And of course, 
shameless plug, a whole bunch of slides that are not shown here. So language, I'll attempt to speak mostly English. I won't try to do too much geeky talking. We will use some geeky terms, but we'll make sure to define them. Ethics, only talking about research experience, not ethics, not legality. Uh, standard caveat, THC marijuana is still federally illegal. Talk to your physician if you have any medical reasons to use it. The standard stuff. Anyone familiar with this picture at all? So the rumor was that this was a pool out in the middle of the Mojave Desert. And you had to go to the specific location in LA. They would give you the GPS coordinates and a key to unlock it. You could wander out in the middle of the desert and it had a solar panel, was supposedly self-fulfilling and had everything you needed. There's a little checklist. You could do your super cool Instagram pic of you hanging out in this pool in the middle of the desert and then close it back up and theory would just still be there for the next person. Uh, I don't know if that was all entirely made up in Photoshop, but it sounded kind of cool. And that's about, in my opinion, the state of the research with CBD right now. <laughs> it's kind of like a pool in the middle of the Mojave somewhere where, yeah, there's some cool stuff there. There's actually some legit research, but man, it's really bleeding edge. And some of the studies, like I'm a nerd who will actually pull like some of the original uh, research studies and read them doesn't always match up with what people are saying about those studies. So some of the original stuff on cannabis, this goes back to 1887, was one of the original kind of books that were published on it. And you can even take a cannabis training university now. Uh, it was 250 bucks. If it was really cheap, I wanted to do it just to see what it was actually. So we're going to do a very short crash course on weed school. Because basically when I started looking into this, I didn't know anything about it. I was, you know, grew up when it's like, oh, you smoke cannabis, you're just going to become one with your couch cushion, your life's going to hell, and it's just all bad news. So subtypes, right? How many people have heard of subtypes of cannabis? What's one of them? Sativa, yes. What's the other one? Indica, yes. Anyone know a third one? Uh, hybrid would be a mix of the two, correct? Close, ruderalis, which is more of a fiber usage. So anyone know what a picture of this is? If one of those three, what'd you have to guess? Sativa, yep, correct. And this would be a indica, this would be ruderalis. And the theory is that these strains are very popular. If you go to any you know cannabis store, they'll talk to you about them. And the theory was that if you take a sativa, because the plants grow so much taller and high away from the ground, it's supposed to be very uplifting, right? If you have an indica, because it's this short, kind of scrubby, shrubby looking thing, it's supposed to get you closer to the ground and kind of mellow you out. And then ruderalis, no one sells it because there's not much THC in it, so no one really cares anymore. But is that any of that actually true? Can we genetically look and differentiate between any of these strains at all? Can we even differentiate between uh, marijuana and hemp? So they did a study of over 14,000 SNPs, so single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, they genotyped in 81 marijuana and 43 hemp samples. And they were able to differentiate at a genome-wide level the differences between those two. So moderate, however, correlation between genetic reports of marijuana strains and reported sativa and indica. So if you go to most stores, they'd be like, oh, this is definitely the way that it is. And in reality, probably not. So even though everybody uses this now, my prediction is that'll change probably in the next few years. Um, strain names actually do not reflect a meaningful genetic identity. And there probably is some truth to how those plants um, affect you, but that may be due to the terpene content, that may be due to the other phytochemicals that are actually in the plant itself. And it turns out they've been so crossbred since the beginning of time. If you give me a mass spec and you say, hey, this is 100% sativa strain, I know it is, bro. I want you to take it to your lab and test it. Well, you have to compare it against 100% sativa strain that you know for sure is that to see what percentage of it it is. And we don't have 100% pure samples. 
Uh, the original name of sativa goes back to a guy named Fux, <laughs> actually F-U-C-H, and that was 1542, and he said that it's a cultivated cannabis, and they just called it a sativa. Uh, indica was about 200 years later, so the names are just kind of very loosely associated with it. So the reason this becomes important is because if you're looking at something like that we take for granted as a strain name, oh, that has to be something true, not so much. Um, so what do you do instead if you want to go really crazy and look at the compounds in it? This is an open access paper you can download. And in the future, they're probably going to have different uh, fact panels like this. This is one from Phytofacts. And it's telling you the cannabinoid content, what is the weight, what is the strain, what is the aroma and flavor, what is kind of the potential of it. Uh, this one will also list terpene contents. And a lot of these plants have a ton of different compounds in them. And they've been so crossbred that just putting a name on it, probably not that useful. So we're probably going to need more of like a fingerprint of just a chemical analysis in the future if we're going to have any idea in terms of research of trying to figure out what this is. Right? So if you're reading some research and it says this sativa or this indica, probably want to know what are the compounds that are in that. So then to make it more complicated, the compounds can be divided into different categories. So we have phytocannabinoids. So these are cannabinoids that are found in the leaves, the flowers, the stems, and the seeds from the cannabis plant. And where you take different parts of the plant will actually have slightly different chemical properties also. And then we have the endogenous cannabinoid system in the body. Uh, the primary ones here are what's called AE, anandamide, or 2-AG. So your body has this whole entire endocannabinoid system that oddly enough, out of all the physiology I took, no one ever mentioned it like once to me, which is crazy. So one of the things I was looking at with CBD was, oh, do we even have a system that may interact to have all these sort of pluripotent effects from helping your sex life to reducing pain to all these other things? And it turns out the endocannabinoid system is involved in almost every system in the body. So there is at least some physiologic underpinning that these compounds could interact with that and there is a basis that they may have a very wide range of effects. We also have purified compounds that are isolated from the plant. So CBD, uh, Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol or THC are the most common that you'll hear about. And there's a whole bunch of synthetics that primarily pharmaceutical companies were working on. So there's specific types of what's called CB1 or CB2 agonist. So if you look at the endocannabinoid system, the first thing you'll find is there's a cannabinoid 1 and a cannabinoid 2 receptor. There's also a bunch of different other things that it interacts with from uh, G-coupled proteins to ligand receptor ones like TVRP1. But the pharmaceutical companies have been trying to make artificial versions of this because cannabis is considered federally illegal. And they've had some mixed success. There's a couple that are approved, but a lot of the research that even has been published, yeah, some of them didn't turn out to be as beneficial as they thought. So if we want to differentiate what is marijuana versus hemp, an easy way to do it is primarily looking at THC content. So that's for the THC itself, and that'll help us kind of differentiate what it is. In terms of legality, that'll also differentiate are you in possession of something like hemp? If you're under 0.3% THC, to the government standards, that's considered hemp. And now that's regulated under the Department of Agriculture, uh, not the DEA, not the FDA, that type of thing. So that's also why you see an explosion of CBD products, because it can be sold legally as a supplement, even though THC is federally illegal. So there's about 113 different cannabinoids that have been identified in cannabis so far. Uh, THC was first isolated in 1964. And out of all the 113, THC is the only one that appears to be psychoactive. All the other components, uh, even CBD, are not psychoactive. There's one or two that are borderline if you get them in high enough doses. So CBD was first isolated in 1940, so actually before THC. Uh, it's non-psychoactive and currently is considered legal. 
Do these directly interact on CB1 and CB2 receptors? Mm, debatable, right? So the standard folklore is that CB1 is just only in the brain, CB2 is more body, but that's not entirely true either. You can find CB2 receptors in the brain on different parts of it. So trying to have a nice simple story with that uh, hasn't really worked out so well, unfortunately. So as you said, Scheduled 1 uh, plant right now by the government. I won't spend a bunch of time on this. So Scheduled 1 means it has a high addiction potential and has no medical use, which has not been shown to be true. They actually approved a synthetic form of Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, Marinol. Uh, that was in 1994. So for many years, they've had something that says, oh, we have a drug that is literally THC and it has medical use. Oops, this plant over here, nope, no medical use. Don't pay any attention to that. Um, does anyone know what cocaine is for a scheduled drug? It's actually two, so that means it probably has a medical use. Anyone know what that medical use would be? Bingo, he nailed it. General anesthetic for nose surgery. That's actually true. <laughs> I don't know how they figured that one out. Boggles the mind. So even cocaine is considered a Schedule II. Um, there's all sorts of rumors, conspiracy theories, if the government's going to change the legality of it. Who knows? Uh, in my opinion, hopefully, because from a pure research standpoint, to run research in the U.S. on a Scheduled I federal drug, the amount of paperwork you have to do is astronomical. And up until a few years ago, you literally then, because it was a controlled drug, the government had to control the sourcing of all of it, even once you got all the past the paperwork, and there's only like one little plant that could be grown in like, Mississippi somewhere. They've changed that so you can kind of get it from other sources now once it's approved. Um, delivery methods also make a big difference. So if we're looking at cannabinoids and things like CBD, how you take them in makes a massive difference to the uh, different effects. So this was 1870, was the first recorded medical uh, thing for cannabis as something that was smoked. Obviously, you can inhale it or smoke it. Uh, you can now vaporize it, which has pros and cons. This can also be done as what's called an oil or a flower. You can get concentrated oils, or you can take the actual flower, the plant itself, which has been dried. If you're using an oil, now you have to look to see, okay, what did the manufacturer put in there? What other compounds did they put in there also? Or you can go kind of the, the old school way, which I showed, which is 1870 is the first reference. Have you ever used them as an edible? Uh, step one, ask them what their experience was because it's always a funny story. Um, step two is to realize that it's actually a different compound entirely. So if you consume THC in an edible format, the first thing that does is the liver converts it to something called 11-hydroxy-THC. And for all practical purpose and pharmacokinetics, it may as well be a completely different drug. So now how you take in the compound even the same compound can have completely different physiologic effects. There's even transdermal approaches and probably a whole bunch of other novel stuff coming. So uh, vaping, so looking at vapor and so the, ooh, that's weird, um, of CBD actually in rats. So they're looking to see if we inject them with CBD or if they vape CBD, do they have different effects? The answer is yes. And when I got the full study, because I like reading full studies, um, <laughs> I was hoping to find that picture. No, I wasn't. They put them in a chamber and then put the stuff in there. So no rats were found vaping in their little corners, hanging out in their lounges. <laughs> I thought that'd be a cool picture, though. Um, so another process you have to go through is that at some point, so if they're taking the raw compound and, say, making CBD or cannabinoid, they have to do something called a decarboxylation. So if you wander through, let's say, a field of cannabis and decide to be a rabbit and just munch on all of it, not much is really going to happen to you. It has to be decarboxylated and changed into THC. So the main things that do that are going to be heat and time. So you notice in delivery methods, they're normally applying heat or time. So in manufacturing, how decarboxylation is done in preparation of CBD can make a difference and it may actually allow you to pull out different compounds at that time. 
So this is just saying the same thing, that the compounds that are active in the plant uh, don't do anything until they've been decarboxylated. So these cannabinoids do not occur in significant concentrations in cannabis. So the pure THC and CBD are in a slightly different form in the plant. So you have to apply decarboxylation to get it out. So hopefully we're not too far into the weeds and didn't confuse all of you entirely yet. Reason for pointing this stuff out is because if you're reading research or you want to know what questions to ask people about CBD, these are some things that you want to consider. Again, this is the same thing just talking about the conversion. It's actually CBDA and THCAA that's converted. Time, temperature, you can get fancy and use pressure, critical CO2 extraction, things of that nature. Now, if you want to get different cannabinoids out of, let's say, you're using uh, cannabis, one of the myths was, oh, we'll just put it in a vaporizer and we'll do it at a different temperature. So you can try to get CBD only without getting THC. Yeah, not so much. The boiling point of THC and CBD are almost the same, meaning that if you're vaporizing it to get CBD, if the compound you put in has high amounts of THC, you will get high amounts of THC because you're going to need a high vaporation point to do that. However, <clears throat> if you're looking at that beta carophylline or other cannabinoids, you may get by a lower temperature. Some of the terpenes actually come out at a lower temperature. So depending upon what compound you're trying to get, changing vaporization temperature might be useful. So there is a patent on cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants, which was issued on CBD in 2003. Uh, it does expire later this year, which will be very interesting to see what happens with that. As I mentioned, CBD now is legal because in the hemp plant, if you're under 0.3% THC, it's under the Department of Agriculture, which allowed all sorts of people to start producing CBD now. Again, we can talk later about all products are not going to be equal. Two takeaways on that. Uh, actual CBD and cannabinoids right now are very expensive. So if it's dirt cheap and it's at the checkout point of your local gas station, I'm probably not going to buy it, right? Um, you'll notice a lot of companies all of a sudden just sprouted up in the last couple months too. Eh, I probably don't trust them either because if they get shut down, there isn't much for them to lose. If you're a larger company, you've been around for quite a while, you're well established. If you screw up, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Odds are you're probably going to be a little bit better quality. Um, CBD is approved now, uh, Epidiolex, for different parts of epilepsy. So we do have a pharmaceutical grade CBD that has been approved to treat a specific condition. So exercise performance. So I get all sorts of crazy emails from people that swear it helped them with exercise or it was horrible for exercise. Not much data. Uh, this is 1975, was one of the earliest ones I could find. Uh, very crude, this is literally in their method section. 1.4 grams cannabis glass pipe. That was it, that was it. Slight increase in heart rate and blood pressure. Uh, decreased work capacity. Probably not that surprising. Uh, no change in lung function or grip strength. Because one of the questions people worry about is, if I'm using these compounds, do I get what's called reverse gains? Do I go from that to that? And if you notice, they're different people, so probably not, right? It's probably not going to cost you a ton of muscle, but is it really going to enhance performance? Another study, 12 subjects. Again, very early study, uh, 1986, single cigarette of smoked cannabis, 1.7% THC. So now they actually are starting to look at percentages. You'll notice that back then that was considered relatively high as a percentage. Now that's considered ungodly low because everybody went and bred the highest amount of THC they could find because when it was illegal, if you were getting busted, it was per weight. So if you could get a higher percentage of THC, you could sell it and make more money. So there was a huge drive to push up via breeding high amounts of THC. They didn't use a placebo condition, which that's understandable because it's kind of hard. Uh, they did find it did re reduce max work capacity, raised heart rate, and increased metabolic rate. A little metabolic rate increase was very minor. And if you're in Canada, it's approved there and legal now. So no direct evidence of performance enhancing effects in athletes. 
Potential benefit of cannabis, though, may be in part due to pain management, concussion-related symptoms, and deserves further research. It's from 2018. Again, another study just looking at um, more of a pathology. No effect there. Uh, Meta-analysis, effect of THC in association with exercise. Not really shown any uh, performance improvement. Uh, I thought this was a good note. Some subjects could not complete an exercise protocol because of adverse reactions caused by cannabis. And one of the things you'll find is even giving, in a research setting, a known dose, you're going to have massively different responses between people. Again, it's just saying that, hey, we need more information. Is it toxic? Well, there was one study. This was done in mice. So whenever I do a mice study, I put a little mouse up there that showed maybe there might be an effect of brain mitochondria. But again, that was in a mouse study, was in a petri dish. There's other studies to show that that wasn't really true. Again, it's a study if you want to look at it. So THC may increase ROS production in the brain, which may contribute to toxicity. Again, wasn't really shown by other studies. It's my buddy Lee Boyce, who's in Canada, so he can do whatever he wants with it. <laughs> uh, may be considered doping. Again, this is debatable. Uh, even for strong men now, world's strongest man, uh, they got approval that cannabis is no longer tested for. So sometimes it may depend on the group of people that you're participating with. So again, I know this is like a huge fire hose of information, but we'll, we'll get through to some useful stuff here. And it may feel like you got on Be Real show and got hot box for too much information. So recovery CBD to THC, they're very similar. Uh, there is some pretty good data that CBD may be helpful for pain. But again, if you look at this, it's mixed between THC, CBD, what was it? Was it synthetic? Was it a cannabinoid? How was it done? Was it done in animals? What was the change? How much of a change? It gets messy like really fast. But some of the terpene compounds appear to be helpful in neurotic pain. Again, in mice studies, again, most people don't really care about research. They're just going to kind of go ahead and do whatever they find useful. There is some good data. CBD may be helpful with inflammation. Again, this is another one looking at this for sleep. So one of the other big questions I get is, will CBD help my sleep? The answer is maybe. There is some physiologic mechanisms. The endocannabinoid system does help regulate something called sleep stability. So there is a physiologic underpinning that would make sense with that. Um, and again, another study showing the endocannabinoid system is actually involved in sleep also. Uh, this was a very new study that did a review of the clinical trials on this. is August 2019, so literally a couple days ago. Uh, I said, while many of the studies did show a positive effect on sleep, many limiting factors, small sample size, and a whole bunch of other caveats. So, yeah, maybe. Uh, this is another good review of the literature. said the same thing. Uh, may hold promise for REM sleep behavior disorder. So a lot of the research that you'll see on CBD cannabinoids for sleep is primarily in people who have frank pathologies. They got some stuff going really, really wrong. That may not necessarily transfer to people who are already healthy, trying to increase their deep sleep or things for recovery. So again, those things are debatable. What I have seen is that there is some data to support CBD reducing anxiety. One of the main ways they did anxiety inducing in studies was to tell people they're going to do public speaking, which scared the crap out of the people in the studies. And then they dosed them with different amounts of CBD. And there's been four studies that have looked at that. And in general, it showed a reduction in anxiety with some fear provoking activity. So I have noticed that anxiety, people just tend to be a little bit more jittery. It does appear anecdotally to help those people more with sleep. So I've played around with this a lot. This is an aura ring shot. I've done dosages of CBD from 30 milligrams up to like 300 milligrams. Uh, if you do 300 milligrams of CBD, like legit CBD, um, it's very hard on your bank account. So I don't recommend doing that a lot because it's very expensive. Um, AM, PM, I've done split. Again, anecdotally, I've noticed 60 milligrams appears for me to be kind of a minimum dose. So dosing appears to be all across the map. Another trick is if you put the tincture in and you hold it under your tongue, 
you get a lot more absorption actually through the mouth itself. Now, by the FDA, most supplement companies can't recommend that because that is not considered a viable ingestion method of a supplement. It's considered an alternative delivery method, which then possibly puts in the category of you selling a drug, which puts supplement companies in danger. But FYI, you heard it from a little birdie, you may be able to do that. I think the number one thing is that use in possible head trauma. So this is for THC, this is an older study. So THC at this time was illegal, so they can only do a retrospective study. And what they found was that positive THC screen was associated with a decreased mortality in adult patients sustaining a TBI, or traumatic brain injury. So some data that the THC component may be beneficial for that. Uh, we know if you get whacked on the head really hard, there's a transient disruption of the blood-brain barrier integrity, meaning your blood-brain barrier that normally keeps a bunch of stuff out can open up, and this will peak at about four hours, and you have a massive amount of neuroinflammation at that point. Uh, cannabinoids themselves in a rat study show they may even protect the blood-brain barrier if given prophylactically. So if you were taking these compounds and you get whacked on the head, there's a chance that you may have less of that blood-brain barrier opening up. We're just wrapping up here at the end. Are cannabinoids considered safe? Generally, yes. You can read all sorts of studies on that if you want. They're there for your perusing. So what are practical points, right? And I know this is like in a complete fire hose of information. Uh, obviously, warning about legality. Uh, THC and CBD kind of have their own beneficial components. Uh, there is some data to show that combining them may be useful. So now when you buy a CBD product, it's legal to sell 0.3% THC in that product. Uh, the people I've talked to and the research I've looked at, if you're not being tested for THC, having that very small amount of THC, which you're not going to feel, probably going to be beneficial because there seems to be a little bit of a synergistic effect. The method of consumption will vary a lot. Obviously, it hasn't been tested in a lot of different sports, so depending on what sport you're looking at, it may be beneficial. Again, make sure to test your own outcomes to see what you find. Again, there's not a lot of current data. So you're kind of left to look at what is the kind of risk versus reward. So what are the pros, in my opinion, of just CBD itself? It may help inflammation and pain. I would say there's some pretty good data on that right now. Again, a lot of the early data is animal studies. Uh, it is currently legal. I do think the TBI head trauma is probably what I would consider using it for. And then cons, expensive, not much long-term data. A starting point, I would say, mixed cannabinoids standardized to about 18 milligrams of CBD. If you were to start with something, that's where I would probably start. If you're below that, you're going to spend a lot of money, probably not see much of an effect. Uh, start there, probably work your way up. I do like the mixed cannabinoids if you can find them in a hemp oil as opposed to just the CBD isolate only. And fortunately, they just told me my time is, is the time up or is it time for questions? I'm at 33 minutes. Time for questions. Cool. All right. So we'll take some questions now for a few minutes. So thank you for your time, and we'll take questions. Please line up here for questions. We have approximately seven minutes. Hey, Mike. Great job in the presentation. I have an anti-aging podcast and I've stayed away from CBD and cannabis for various reasons. In your opinion, with all the research you've done, what are some of the anti-aging benefits of cannabis, and how would you incorporate these into an anti-aging protocol? Yeah, I would say for anti-aging, for healthy people, there's just not a ton of data. Most of the data is on frank pathologies. My personal bias is I'll use 20 milligrams of a CBD in a mixed hemp oil daily or every other day. I mean, I think that's a small enough dose. There's probably not many downsides. Um, if you do get any benefit in neural inflammation, things of that, there's some data to show you can get it in that small of a dose. And obviously, CBD doesn't have any of the psychoactive legality things with it. So if I were to start, that's probably where I would start personally. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. 
Hi. You're so funny. It was fun to listen to you talk. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I read an article recently, a quick comment I'd like to contribute before I ask a question, but the article was talking about the future of CBD um, forms being like water-based delivery and CO2 extraction. Uh, there's a company, Elixinol, I'm, I'm a fan yep. of. Of course, it's more expensive, but when you're looking at these liposome, liposomal um, applications versus a tincture, you get much quicker delivery and you can, especially if they're full spectrum, get a lower dose um, to get the same results. So I um, wanted to contribute that for anyone interested in maximizing your you know, your return on that investment. And my question for you was regarding the THC types because I do order from a brand that gives that full analysis like the one you shared, and it shows total THC is above the um, legal limit, but THC 9 is below 0.3%, and the company said that that's the one that you have to comply with to be legal? Correct. Yeah. So it's are the other ones non-psychoactive? or? There's different subtypes of cannabinoids in there. The only one that has psychoactive properties is uh, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. So that is the only one that has regulation to okay. sell CBD. That has to be under 0.3%. Yeah, so if there's like THC-8 and it's like 4% or something, that doesn't matter? Doesn't seem to matter. Yeah, it just also depends upon what cannabinoids they're calling out and that type of thing too. But okay. yeah, you're correct right now. Delta-9 is the only one that has regulatory implications on it. It's the only one so far that appears to have psychoactive properties, which is probably why. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, so I... I know that you have probably heard of the entourage effect and yes. you, you believe in full spectrum. And I was just curious if you think there's another cannabinoid that's kind of the next uh, big thing after CBD, like CBN, yeah. CBC. Yeah. Whatever. So entourage effect means, is there a synergistic effect with some of the other compounds that are found? There's some pretty good data to say that that's true. Like the entourage effect was coined about 20 years ago. If you compare the drug versions, which are just synthetic versions, to the whole extract, you can get by with less of the whole extract compared to the pure synthetic. So that does support the entourage effect. My advice to companies that are doing research, especially in the supplement area, is the other cannabinoids are not very well explored yet. There is CBD and THC, and then probably about well over another hundred different ones. Right. There is some data, I would say, the ones that I would be most interested in would be CBN, most likely for sleep, uh, beta canopheline, some of those for pain and other things like that. Um, with different extraction methods, you can get them out now. So one of the limiting factors a lot of times is the plant material, getting strains that are high enough in that to get enough material to make it basically profitable. Right. So yeah, there's... And there's so many to look at, right. um, but those, if I were to highlight two, those would probably be the two that I would be looking so at. CBN, and what was the other one? Uh, beta carophylline. Is there an acronym for that? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I think it's right. technically a terpene, not a cannabinoid. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the terpenes get really messy really fast, too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, good question. Hi, I'm a historian, so I'm, I'm really interested in, like, all of the historical information. Oh, yeah, cool. there too. Um, I've seen uh, listings of uh, marijuana products from like the 1870s, 1880s. Yeah. Uh, yeah, typically uh, used as aphrodisiacs. Sure. Um, and I'm kind of curious about the research on the relationship between marijuana and libido because some of the studies I've seen on it seem to show no effect. But anecdotally, we know a lot of people find it incredibly helpful for erotic experience. I wondered if you'd seen research about that too. I mean, I've only looked at a couple a couple things and it was pretty mixed. There isn't, from what I've seen, not a ton of data on it, but I think it's probably related to things like sleep, right? If you're a very anxious type and that makes you more relaxed, eh, probably gonna be beneficial for you. If you're not that kind of type of personality or you have maybe different genetic SNPs of how you process THC and the other compounds, maybe it's not as beneficial. So yeah, I don't really have any good advice to report on that, to be honest. But I will say anecdotally, that's something you do hear about a lot. Thank you. Hi, that was very informative. I'm curious what you found in your research, given the opioid epidemic, 
there are a lot of pain patients that are being cut off by their meds that are allowing them to continue life. Uh, do you think the laws are going to be more accepting? I mean, I come from Colorado, so life's decent, sure. but not everyone's that lucky. Yeah, there's, I think, a good enough argument to make that, you know, cannabis, marijuana, CBD, THC, as an alternative, especially with much less downside, at least should be considered. And for better or worse, because the opioid epidemic is so bad, that may put enough pressure on the government to actually make them legal and actually have more research and have more physicians and people aware of that as an option. I mean, I have some very good friends who, you know, they went to the VA and unfortunately left with a, a sack full of opiates and you went home and threw them in the trash and used different, different methods and you said, you know, worked fine. So I think we always have to look at what are we, you know, are the upsides, what are the downsides? And we do have very good data to show that, at least with cannabis, the downsides, there are some, obviously, nothing's risk-free, uh, but they are minimal, especially compared to things as opiates. So I think it should be at least made more of an option uh, for people, and especially more research to have very hard data to show uh, what instances it may be beneficial. For example, neuropic pain, uh, different things like that. It's, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. One last quick question. Uh, Are we at time? No, we're, we're out. <laughs> we're out. All right, cool. Another round of applause for Dr. Mike Nelson.